So I found this really great article on iOS XR introduction. Uh, introduction. Uh, it's done by a CCIE. Uh, he works for a Cisco system, and this is actually one of the first major PowerPoints explaining what iOS XR really is. And I thought that was really important, is because when you get into the Cisco realm of programming, it's sometimes hard to uh, understand or uh, fully grasp how the different operating systems affect one another. So I thought this article did a really good job explaining what uh, iOS XR was, what some of the features were, how to install it, how to configure it, how to troubleshoot it. Uh, keeping in mind iOS XR, it's a carrier grade OS and that's the important thing to realize here is it's carrier grade. So what exactly does that mean? Before we get to that, again our topics are going to be the packaging, the installation, the configuring and troubleshooting of XR. But let's go back to that. What does carrier grade mean? All that really means is it's an iOS that pays more attention to things like scalability, high, avail uh, high availability, security and flexibility. That's not to say that the current iOS does not, because it does. It's just it's not as fluid or dynamic or as flexible as iOS XR. And so that's why we have to have a new operating system. It's also partially due to the way that iOS is uh, programmed. I mean, it has a very specific structure, and it's hard to manipulate that structure using some type of routing uh, policy, if-then statements. That doesn't happen in iOS, though it can happen in iOS XR. So just some structural changes. Before we can hop too far into understanding what XR is, we have to understand what a operating system is. And that's pretty straightforward. An operating system normally consists of the kernel, which is the core piece of software that allows for interaction with the hardware. For example, the CPU, memory, applications, processes, items like that. Uh, our operating system controls things like what's in our kernel space, what's in our user space. These are software components that sit on top of the hardware. That way, we, the users, can actually interact with that hardware. That's the main portion of our kernel. So, part of the XROS, uh, part of that, uh, the software that is built into it, it's a distributed subsystem process plane. And what that means is, we build on top of a predefined kernel. And Part of that is separated into three different planes, control, data, and management, but we can actually protect our kernel while running these additional processes on top of our kernel. Things like our routing protocols within our control plane. We can control that while still protecting the kernel uh, so it doesn't crash or uh, help with the security for buffer for, uh, overflow, things like that nature. If we're talking about our data plan, that would be controlling access to our ACLs. But again, making sure that our microkernel, or even just our kernel, is in memory protection. That way, if there is an issue or an error or overflow within our ACLs, our kernel is not directly affected. Thus, not being able to allow our kernel or our core system to uh, get bogged down or uh, have exploits ran against it. It's all about being able to protect the processed memory space from attack. Uh, also part of this does uh, separation of functionality. That isolation allows for some fault tolerance. That way, if you're uh, having a targeted attack targeting a data plane, that targeted attack cannot jump to a different control plane. We already talked about this in a previous lecture, but again, our microkernel controls things such as our messaging, our routing, uh, our SSH, our 
several processes. It just it's all about being able to manage individual functionality without them interfering with one another. So how does this differ from iOS? iOS is monolithic versus XR, which is a microkernel. The big thing there is, is memory protected? In iOS, it's not. It's all shared memory. Thus, uh, overflow attacks or some types of vulnerabilities that target memory are more likely to occur within iOS versus XR. Uh, are the processes uh, being able to be scheduled or restarted uh, without the device being restarted? In iOS, it's not. In XR, it is. Because you have to remember, XR is running on our CRS systems or our ASR1000 Plus series. That means those are core routers that don't get restarted often. And that's important to realize because our iOS is not on normally core routers. Those routers have to be restarted for services to be restarted. And realistically, you're not going to restart a core device to get functionality back. I mean, these devices are as, ex as expensive as they are because they're not made to be restarted. They're made to be running for several years before ever being restarted. Again, that CSR1 router is a half a million dollars. So let's talk how do we install our XROS. Just like within our iOS, it's all about our configuration files. But here, they're called .pies. And we have a .py for very specific uh, packages. Here is just a quick uh, boot, uh, boot file of our pies and SMUs. Our SMUs are software maintenance units, and those are things that are like fixes. So our pies could be optional or mandatory, just kind of depending on what we're looking at. For example, if we're dealing with our MPL MPLS, we uh, would have to have a pie that handles that. If we're dealing with our multicast, again, we'd have to have a pie that handles that. This is all very specific license functionality depending on your needs. In essence, it's a way for them to make more money, yes, but at the same time, it's also a way for them to verify that you're only getting services that, one, you need, two, that you're going to be using. That way, you don't have to worry about a tax service that may have vulnerabilities that you're not using. Alright, so how do we install it? So, for the installation, we go in for to our raw, raw mon mode. And normally, we can do things for Turbo Boost. Which that's uh, essentially booting the router from our RON MON mode for faster uh, functionality. Once we set it so that it is going to boot from RON MON mode, we tell it where we're going to be booting from. And that's where you actually have to go in and tell it boot from set where it's located at. And that would be our example. Unset boot. We're going to be turbo booting on disk zero. We're going to sync it and then reset. We're going to tell it boot from disk zero, and then we tell it what pi to load. Within turbo boost variables in Wama mode, on and boot, those are kind of important. Uh, also, you want to make sure that you're doing the correct versions and that you're setting them active. The reason I say that is because in this type of configuration, we'll see later, but you can actually turn on multiple pies at once. You just tell it boot these pies, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, and you tell them what pies. But that way you're not having to add them one at a time. And you can turn on very specific functionality that you want all at once. Some of the hardware, uh, it has to have a 40 gig uh, hard disk. That's one of the big ones. It has to be on a device that can handle XR. That's another one. It has to have very specific line card firmware. And it has to have, again, a, a router that can handle the XR OS. Our configuration, uh, again, 
they're pretty similar to iOS except here there's no difference between startup and running so the interesting thing here is the first thing that you do is you configure it once you configure it from our running load you configure those changes once those changes are committed then that becomes the new running config the new running config is our startup config so we're not actually making changes on the fly we make the change we uh, configure the change we commit the change then it actually does the configuration within the database that's what it loads that's kind of nice if you ever dealt with iOS and you wanted to for example clear the NAT, uh, NAT cache sometimes that would actually overload a router and cause it to reset here with the commit changes nothing is truly committed until you actually run the commit command thus upgrading the new running configuration with your current changes that way you can always go back before committing your changes just to verify one of the last things is troubleshooting what are our cards what are their firmware what type of captures can we do what about uh, crash logs are they available yes they are uh, a big thing here is realize that we're using line cards and each line card is going to have its own separate control data and management plane and each line card is going to have its own configuration and its own log files so that the overall router as a whole is not affected by an individual line card you can isolate individual line cards or you can group them or you can do an expanded shelf just kind of depending on your situation big thing here is there's plenty of log files for you to review alright thank you for this one hang tight we'll get the next one started in here in just a second alright so one of the projects I had to work on when I was doing some work for the UC uh, system in California it wasn't so much specifically UCSF uh, mine was UCF was University uh, of California the Fresno campus and one of the case studies that uh, I was preparing while I was there was actually looking at the UCSF uh, architecture and infrastructure uh, progress report and I thought this was a great one for us to discuss because it deals with the importance of our enterprise architecture and infrastructure development and more specifically MPLS versus UCSF uh, that one network concept uh, utilizing MPLS or other technologies like VPLS to uh, well pretty much extend our LAN across a large uh, WAN and so we're all going to also be talking about services like DNS and DHCP and uh, backups within uh, our infrastructure but before we uh, get to that point we have to talk about some acronyms first first of all what is MPLS what is VPLS MPLS is multi protocol label switching uh, basically it's a layer 2 technology for quick switching on a logical network so that it can share a physical media if you ever dealt with like a uh, frame relay or ATM those are also layer 2 technologies that pretty much do the same thing it just those are outdated MPLS is what took over uh, VPLS is VPN uh, LAN services it's just the same general concept of MPLS except via VPNs. Uh, they did pretty much the same thing with uh, the PEs versus the CEs. That's a provider edge versus the customer edge and the routing of traffic back and forth. And lastly, uh, QoS, which is quality of service, which we've been dealing with. So the goal for MPLS is high redundant enterprise network. And that's going to be specifically at the core. Uh, here, because UCSF uh, is spread all across uh, San Francisco they wanted a redundant enterprise core shared between their campus and medical centers this is just a case study specific at UCSF but it's the principle that's what we're, we're going after is the principle which is a high redundant enterprise network comprised of multiple MPSL connections between locations that's the goal uh, 
Another goal here was uh, capacity or the capability to provide uh, multiple segregated networks on a shared equipment. Again, this major VLANing between individual campuses and uh, shared, uh, shared resources between campuses and on individual campuses. This also deals with communication between the segmented uh, areas. For example, uh, VoIP, if we have a phone service, we want to be able to share that VLAN across all campuses so that they can connect back to a centralized VoIP server. Uh, we may or may not want that s same voice VLAN communicating to other VLANs. It just kind of depends on the policy that's in place. Uh, of course, in, in uh, connectivity within our QoS, because we're probably going to be doing some high uh, real-time type traffic, so our latency is a concern. So high dependability, things like VoIP will probably be there. A unified support for multicast systems. And the, again, the ability to provision layers between any of the two points in the network, thus allowing for a borderless data center. It's all about being able to be virtual and not being tied down, being flexible enough to do what you need to do. Some of the nice benefits here with MPLS is it simplifies and consolidates the routing and security infrastructure since everything is on just layer two uh, same devices. It allows us to leverage man upgrades because again, think because it will be a it should be a man because obviously our LAN is actually going to be spanning a large geographical area, not so much large enough to be a WAN, but it's going to be at least city-wide, so it's going to be called our man. Again, segregating into logical groups or devices based on uh, cri any criteria. It could be physical location. We could have a VLAN for, you know, one campus, and within that VLAN for that one campus, we could have separate VLANs for the devices on that one campus. So we could be using a combination of private versus public VLANs. Uh, benefits here, lower cost. If we're able to uh, leverage our existing equipment and per, uh, do this type of network design, we don't have to buy any additional equipment. Win-win for everyone. Uh, one of the benefits by doing it this way with MPLS and VPLS better availability, better uh, capacity, and uh, better capability to achieve all of the uh, core objectives. That's the main purpose for our advanced network design, is being able to define realistic expectations and goals, and leveraging our technology, both current and maybe planned purchases, so that we can uh, actually observe and meet all objectives. So here we have our PEs. That is going to be our provider edge. Not our customer's edge, but the provider's edge. Because our MPLS is going to be provided by a provider. And then from there we just connect our customer edge to their provider's edge. And that allows us to seamlessly go between our multi-campuses, or if you don't want to apply it to a campus, I mean within any network. The benefit of this though is there's a clear and just cut line where this is the provider's uh, responsibility, this is the client's responsibility, and as long as you can get the packets to the provider's edge, it's up to the provider to do their portion. It's all about being able to segregate responsibility. And then from there, you would actually be doing the rest of your network design so that we could have our virtual LAN set up at individual campuses. Nice thing is, we could do this at a shared distribution center. Notice this is distribution and access. So it's a little bit lower level. We could do it at a little bit higher level here so that our uh, PE could actually be so that our provider's edge is actually not at a specific campus, but at maybe a specific area of town that our campuses connect to. Uh, 
Why do we do this? It's all so that we could have a better or conjoined shared access switching environment so that we reduce latency. So what type of device does that? A high-end Cisco switch. Our MPLS core and this allows us to do our virtual routing. And this also can allow us to do our firewalls there as, as well. So thus allowing security before it even coming into our campus. And this type of technology can levy a Cisco 6500 series switch. Or it could also be part of the ASR uh, uh, chassis. Normally if we're dealing with a PE device though, it's going to be a high-end ASR Cisco router. It's just that's how it works. Uh, if we're doing an MPLS core, we're looking at our 6500 catas uh, catalyst switch. That just uh, is going to be the best item. Uh, actually, within this project, this is was their status. This is what they actually was able to get and uh, repurpose or reuse. Here is where. our ASR comes in because some of the streamlined services that they needed was only in the ISOXR software at again the higher throughput 100 uh, gigabit plus and so we needed uh, some type of core layer device that would provide the additional bandwidth ASRs had to do that uh, but so one of the cases for reusing our Catalyst 6500 series switch it's before we even get to our PE, our provider's edge, we wanted to expand out our MPLS core for our access. And we were able to do that. Uh, that actually allowed us to have fewer provider edges, thus allowing us to have fewer customer or client edges. So once all of this was put into place, we only had a few additional items to review, and that was our design was up, it was running, it was working, but we didn't have a fully designed PE slash CE design. We were still over utilizing a lot of our equipment, and because of how expensive the equipment was, we were looking at a way to lessen it. So within our design, yes we want to levy our equipment, but sometimes while leveling our equipment we also want to limit the expansion of purchasing new equipment. Because again, some of this equipment is uh, tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. So we want to take that into account when we design our network. Also look at our current uh, security model and how that uh, works. For project management, we were also talking about MPLS core, to our internet, our scheduling, and how to do our, our dis distribution layers. If we wanted MPLS cores to be done at the core layer, or at the access layer, or the uh, distribution layer, and the pros and cons for all of it. Again, it all kind of depends on your situation. Okay, so that's it for this section. And do we have to use Cisco products? That, that's a, an interesting point that I want to talk uh, a little bit later on with one of our next slides is we don't have to do this with Cisco proprietary equipment and that's something that you should take into account. Okay so within the last set of PowerPoints we we're talking about a comparison of products. Uh, so far we've been looking exclusively at like Cisco or Juniper. Um, I got this from a Chinese company. I thought this was kind of interesting because if you start looking at uh, some of the other products, for example, the NE series, that's from a Chinese company called Awi. And you start looking at their comparison, like their 4U unit versus the 10U unit. Uh, and it's, it's just kind of funny because 
This is supposed to be comparable units. And they're actually trying to show that their product is better than Cisco's products. And it's kind of funny because as I start going through more and more of this material, even though the numbers look good, I, j I have a hard time. Uh, it's like uh, pretty similar to our Cisco. They're modular. They have their line cards. Uh, their focus is on uh, high performance, high reliability, high security, a, a lot of additional features. And again, they come in multiple different uh, chassis uh, configurations. But the interesting thing here is these are supposed to be so much faster than uh, a lot of the Cisco versions. And I just that just kind of made me think. One of the major things we have to th uh, remember is when we start comparing these core router products, we have to make sure that we're looking at equivalent series. So the NE series is supposed to be more comparable to the ASR 9000 series. And I was able to snag a comparison. And I was what I started looking at and that was very interesting is a lot of their uh, switching fabric architecture is more uh, cell based while the Cisco is packet based. We look at our VOQ, uh, VOQ buffer capacity and there's over 100 milliseconds versus Cisco's less than 5 milliseconds. Uh, some of this I believe is extremely skewed so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, I'm sorry looking at these comparisons there is something fishy going on the ASR one, uh, 9006 uh, and actually being uh, having a backplane of a switch capacity of 322 gigabits per second versus the low end model of the NE series of 1 terabits per second I don't really think we're comparing apples to uh, apples here I think we're looking at two very different lines of the products and you can also see that with the other additional features. So that's one thing you have to think about when we compare product lines is are we comparing similar products? The last thing I thought was kind of interesting is uh, they have this e-government uh, project which is basically which governments are actually using the Chinese NE version and as I start looking over here, is you look at them, Sierra Leone, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, Madagascar, Kenya, Sudan, Ukraine, Russia, Mexico, Venezuela. You notice these aren't first world countries. Or Russia, Ukraine, some of them are, but they're not they're not like high-ranking countries they're not powerful countries uh, notice China's not using them Japan's not using them Austria uh, Australia's not using them America Canada UK Germany France Italy the major countries that we think about when we think world powers aren't using them but if these were so much better why aren't other governments using them Okay, this is the last slide that I want to cover talking about the NE family series. And I thought this was very interesting. Uh, granted, this is all NE series, but I'm looking at the NE40 versus the NE80. Uh, the 40E X16 versus the NE80E. And then I just, I'm starting to run through the numbers like backbone uh, bandwidth, 30 terabits versus 4 terabits. This is a 32, this is a, a 36U unit. Weight, the 36U unit is slightly heavier, but it's slightly newer. Uh, 
Uh, then we start looking at things like power consumption. We're looking at 6,000 watts versus 7,000 watts for 100 gig. But I thought this was a higher capacity, terabits. So what is the power ratio when we start doing larger uh, switching? So that's a question I thought was very interesting because the documentation is not very straightforward. Okay, so that, that was the last thing I want to talk about with any family. It was just, I want you guys to realize that it's not always based off of Cisco or Juniper. Those are just two major companies within the, the realm of core networking equipment. And they may be popular in the U.S., but I mean, it's not always the U.S. You have to think globally. Give me one second, let me prep the next set of PowerPoints, and I'll be right back. Okay, so the next set of PowerPoints are specifically deploying MPLS uh, and specifically looking at Layer 3 VPNs within that deployed uh, MPLS. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at the overview, the services, best practices, and some con a conclusion. There's some ter a terminology that we're going to have to know. Uh, we've already talked about PE and CE those being our provider and our customer edge. Uh, we have to talk about route distinguishers, route targets, uh, labeling forwarding, forward information in base. A lot of that is terminology dealing with specifically MPLS. So our reference architecture, uh, again our customer edge, then it actually is our provider's edge, and this is their MPLS domain. This is what they control. We're at the customer edge. We send it into our PE. It's their responsibility to get it from one PE to the other end. The interesting thing when dealing with our IPV uh, or IPV <laughs> IP VPNs is that you have to understand that it's not always about a single route. While we may only view it as a single route between our PEs, that's because they're going to use an internal uh, routing protocol. So, for example, an IBGP. Uh, I denoting internal versus external, which is eBGP. Even though within that MPLS network, there could be a lot more switches. We don't really care though. Uh, that's part of the reason that we go with an MPLS network is because we want that end-to-end -end connectivity regardless of how that middle actually takes place. Uh, RPE routers, again, set at the very end because the P is our provider. So our PE actually has to do some form of routing uh, that performs on it. So how does it vary between operating systems? iOS, you normally can just do a show IP route. Uh, with a NX OS, again, show IP route. Only with the newer iOS XR, you have to be more specific. Show route for IPv4 unicast networks. and then that should uh, show you the additional routing information on the provider side. On the customer side, we have to do our VFRs. And that's going to be a, a VFR table. So what is VR, VR RF stand for. That is our virtual routing and forwarder. It's a route. We're just not calling it a route. Because it's part of the VPN 
uh, which is part of the MPLS system, we're going to denote them as VR, uh, VRFs from now uh, on. Each VPN is associated with at least one VRF, though you can't have more than one. And how we do that is we just go in, we go to our VRFs, we label them, we say what theory they're on, and we uh, allow it forwarding to that specific VRF name. Here we defined VRF blue, then we actually drilled down to an interface, then we told it IPVRF forwarding and blue. Blue is just our name. You have to remember that VRFs configured on each PE and thus we have to associate them with a interface which sits between our client and our provider. Well, we don't really have to do it from the client side, but we're going to do it on the link between the two. Our PE will install the internal routes in our global routing table. They also install the VPN uh, routes in the uh, VRF tables. Uh, the VRF is a aware of routing protocol, so it can understand routing updates. Uh, it can also handle static routes, RIPs, BGP, BGP being both eBGP and iBGP, eGRIP and OSPF. Uh, with OSPF, I believe that is both version 2 and version 3. Same thing with e, uh, eGRIP, because within the different versions, you have your uh, IPv4 only, and then you have our updated version for IPv6. interesting thing here is within our VPN infrastructure here we can actually use overlapping IP addresses that's because BGP plays the key role and they handle that with route distinguishers and route targets this is kind of why I asked for your experience because some of this gets super technical and I'm not quite sure we were all at within our understanding of routing, switching, protocol labeling. So that was one of the reasons I had asked kind of where is everyone sitting at for this information. But we can actually do route distinguishers and route targets, thus allowing us to reuse some uh, addressing be, uh, because it's going to go back to a label. Here we can actually look at our packet tracer and then we can drill down into the actual packet that we're getting. Within our VPN, uh, we're going to be using an IPv4 prefix which will be then converted to an, a VPN version 4 prefix. Notice co uh, 1 colon 1 colon 200, one for the one colon one colon that's going to be our route distinguisher that way we can denote where they're coming from from our route distinguishers and then after the last colon that becomes our IPv4 you'll also notice that is within our header as well Then you can actually tell it a route target, and again that's going to be one colon, it doesn't have to be one colon, it's going to be whatever the target uh, number is, and then we assign a label to it. So within this type of technology, it's more of a labeling and path forwarding technology, even though it's using our BGP, well, it's using iBGP. But how does the control plane kind of all work together though? This is the interesting thing here is because it can do route updates. And so a big part of this is our provider's edges will actually send MPIB BGP updates to the other core routers and the other edge routers, thus allowing them the best pathway and how to send the information.
for our site one wanting to send a hop it goes to our PE from our PE through the tunnel using our route target and label which then will be routed through our MPLS backbone well not specifically ours but our providers our PE2 on the other side uh, it will actually look at its local configuration it should import the route target and as long as there's a VRF there and it is matching up to the route target it will translate it back to an IPv4 prefix so it'll take the VPN version 4 prefix reconvert it to an IPv6 or an IPv4 prefix and it'll update the table and then that will be updated to the client edge to router thus allowing it to understand the route in between if we want to again double check them we could be doing our show IP but here we actually want to look at our uh, CEFs again the command structure is uh, slightly different uh, instead of show IPP CEF we can do uh, for our NX OS show forwarding our OSX our O uh, IOS XR that's going to be our show uh, Ceph IPv4 again they're slightly different but and remember we have to make sure we're doing it on the correct port is it going to be the internal providers edge or is it going to be the externals customer's edge because they're going to provide different information so now if we're looking at the forwarding plane we're going to be implying two labels now that's going to be an outer label which is going to be learn to be our LTP and that's going to be part of our P, uh, E address and then we're going to have our internal label which will actually be our routing address uh, it's going to be essentially our interior gateway protocol versus our border gateway protocol using the labels it will send it through and then update records again here is our multi-packet system cause that's, that's essentially what we're doing when we go through an MPLS is we are adding an additional packet or an additional label so that it can communicate easier through the MPLS network that are what our labels and our RD and our RTs are used for So now that we have an idea of our overview, let's talk about our load sharing for multi-home to VPN sites. What happens if you don't have a single PE, but you have two v uh, PEs? Again, it really doesn't matter on our side because we can actually do load sharing. And we can do that with a single CE and two PEs. We can do that with two CEs and two, uh, two PEs. It just kind of depends on our scenario and our configuration and our budget. So let's look at how we would configure that using iOS. We would have to configure a unique RD per VRF, and that's going to be per PE. We have two PEs. So we have to do it twice. Notice here we're using the RD300 colon 11 uh, for our first path or for our PE11 and we're going to be using RD300 colon 12 for our second PE which they just happen to call PE12. On our far right side it's going to be RD300 colon 13. Notice all of them are one-to-one -one paths. 
Now we enable BGP multipath within the relevant uh, BGP uh, BRF address families. That's going to be done on our pathway between our PE and our CE. And that will allow Indian communication using a multi home system. You don't have to use one, you can use more than one. Again, it goes, this goes back to what are you willing to pay? Uh, so, what happens if we don't want to do the load sharing? Kind of expensive. We can look at our hub and spoke uh, services. That's more of a common one. Uh, our hub and spoke is one site or one centralized site, and from there, it goes to multiple. Some of our options are again one PE to one CE, or we can do two PE to uh, just two PEs to a CE. We can actually import and import uh, export route targets within our VRFs for our spoke site. However, we have to make sure that we're doing different tags for each of our PEs. Because our PEs are just the edge of our provider. Internally on their network, they're going to do path selection between their PEs. And we're looking at just getting to our PE and letting the PE or the provider side taking care of them. It's kind of important here that we are not doing any form of BGP aggregation. Our PE hubs don't really like that. Uh, here are import and our export RTs. Our route targets have to be different. And we can actually advertise our spokes, but the information has to be different. In uh, this scenario, because they are different, we can use BGP aggregation. It's going to be a very similar export and import setup. If BGP is used between every PE and CE, we could actually end up with a uh, AS path looping, or at least an AS path mismatch or miscommunication. So we have to be careful when we do our configuration. But why do we care about any of this? Big part of this is how do we verify that with an MPLS VPN network that our packets are going from one location to another? And that's why this is critical. Because we have to understand conceptually how this may work. Because if we are dealing with our client to the provider side, that's one set of technology. But what happens for the person in charge of the in-between provider edges? That's more complex. So we have to kind of take that into account. So one of the last things I do want to cover is planning. Most of this at, at first seems extremely complex. And at first it really is. But once you sit down and you start working with MPLS, and you start actually working between uh, routing clients through an MPLS network, it gets a lot simpler. You just have to sit down, think about it, plan it, and slowly work through it. Once you do that, it's not overly hard. Uh, for a lot of the best practices, it goes back to this plan. We want to use simple combinations of numbers and characteristics for our naming conventions, planning, and just not moving very fast. With our MPLS VPNs, sometimes it's consistency. Uh, that's all I had for this time. I want to thank you guys and hope you have a great night.